What's your favourite sequel? Star Wars Return of the Jedi? Super Smash Bros. Melee? Or Alice in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass? And why is it your favourite? Did it have a different villain? Protagonist? Was there character growth or world development? Or did something shock you to your core? Did one of your favourite characters die? What did it accomplish in your mind that the original never did? According to Writer's Digest, there are seven rules for writing a strong sequel. Don't just pick up where the last story left off. Give the reader something new. Make the stakes different. Play with expectation. Include at least one new great character. Don't be afraid to let beloved characters go. And identify what made the first special, then offer more. The first sequel I ever truly loved, that ever truly dragged me into a world and left me a fan forever, was Pokemon Silver, the video game. I've been thinking about sequels a lot recently. The original Pokemon Adventures took me completely by surprise in its willingness to be everything I'd ever wanted from a Pokemon series. It was violent, action-packed, but most importantly grounded. Grounded in real-world problems that wouldn't start to be taken seriously until over a decade after its initial release. It was ahead of its time in the message it was trying to convey. But it was also part of something bigger. A growing franchise that would become, as of the time of writing, the highest grossing media franchise in the world. I'm not joking, check the wiki page. With a total revenue of an estimated $100 billion, it towers over the Disney Princess franchise, Mickey and Friends, Star Wars, Harry Potter, everything. And even as I'm writing this, I'm still not sure how I feel about its first sequel, Gold and Silver. What's up beautiful people, this is Strawberry Tofu and welcome to uh, part two of our Pokemon Adventures retrospectives. In the last video I asked for feedback and the main comment that I got was not to be scared of spoilers and to go way deeper into the story. So strap in and let's get ready to go explore the Johto region. It's time to get really personal. <laughs> But before we get stuck into the nitty gritty of the video, please make sure that you hit the thumbs up button if you liked the video. By doing that, you let the YouTube algorithm know that you want this video to be suggested to others. And that's just one tiny little thing that you can do that is a really huge help for me. But let's get to it. I'm sure when Hidenori Kosaka signed on to be the writer of this project in the mid 90s, he had no idea the amount of sequels he would need to write, nor the pressure that would come with them an expectation from fans to continuously be as thrilling, innovative and motivated as when he was fresh on the scene. And I'm more than sure that when Marto came on as the artist in our beloved series, they didn't expect their body to give out on them halfway through the first sequel, leaving her successor at the mercy of her own fans. The sequel, any sequel, is cursed from the start. Most of the media I have most enjoyed experiencing for the first time I ever saw, read, listened to it was something I had little to no expectations of going into. The first ever time I saw the first Iron Man film was two years after it had been released, in the dorm room of someone I had just met a few weeks earlier at university. Several of us piled into this tiny single bedroom with a 50 inch TV at the end of the bed, the biggest TV I'd ever seen in my life at that point. We didn't know what to put on, just something in the background, but something we could witness the beauty of this huge HD TV for the first time with. Somebody suggested Iron Man as an easy film everybody, apart from me, had already seen. Something we could talk, drink and laugh over. Fifteen minutes in, and I'm no longer talking to anybody else in the room. Two hours later, and I come out of my movie coma, retuning my ears into the general conversation that's happening around me. I'm in a state of shock. The shock that a piece of cinema had just completely debilitated me for a space of time. When you watch a good movie, any good movie, your hormone levels change. There was a whole study done on it at the University of Michigan in 2004. What changes depends on what type of person you are and what type of movie you're watching. But when high testosterone men watch The Godfather, their testosterone levels jumped as much as 30%. You could essentially say that when your body responds to a good piece of cinema, you end up experiencing a sort of chemical high. And this is where sequels fall short. No high will ever be that same first high. 
you will never experience that exact same euphoria again. And so the mindset in which we go into a sequel with might end up being more important than how good the sequel even is. Now, I know that all my reference points have been movies so far, and so you may question how relevant this is when talking about a manga. They're just static images on a page. And while there may be no official study to do with how comic books or manga affect your hormone level, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the saddest book can be just as effective at making you cry as the saddest film. And so my own personal failure to the first Pokemon Adventure sequel is that I went into it completely forgetting that I knew any of this and chasing the original feeling, like an addict. But let's break it down, shall we? We start our journey into Johto in some ways a rather similar manner to our start in Kanto, with the introduction to our protagonist. Only these are two very different protagonists, and that is profoundly shown to us in the opening scenes. In our first chapter with Red, he's nurturing, caring, and a competent trainer, showing young children how to catch their first Pokemon, their potential life partners. He's cocky but endearing, our introduction to Gold has him come across as more of a delinquent. It takes 10 Pokemon to wake him up and get him out of bed. His mom comments on how messy his hair is. He skateboards, plays pool, which is a rather odd hobby for the writer to choose for a 12 year old, I think. And our first interaction with anybody other than his mom is also a child, but he yells and accuses them of doing something that they didn't do. Equally, this does open up an opportunity to show us that Gold 2 is a competent trainer. He does help Joey the kid get his bag of Pokeballs back from the Murkrow that stole them, but the personalities have already been established as contrasting. As I'm reading these first 20 pages, I'm already comparing how Gold makes me feel in comparison to Red. An unfair comparison. And in the end, a comparison that only affects me negatively moving forward. In a complete 360 from yellow, Gold feels very much like a teenager. Chapter 2 is completely motivated by his crush on DJ Mary, a local radio host, and his wanting of an autograph from the fantasy he's built up in his mind. Joey has been given the task of delivering said previously mentioned bag of Pokemon to Professor Elm by Professor Oak, and in a classic teenage move, Gold decides to accompany Joey on his journey in hopes of pestering Oak for an autograph from Mary. They do have a radio show together after all. And despite my moanings of how Gold's personality comes across here, the nostalgia does hit home. Perhaps I had such distinct hopes for this specific sequel because of my own feelings towards the sequel this story is based on. Pokemon Silver was iconic in my own personal story of growing up. I was 10 years old when it was released in November 2001, and in the midst of bullying, school transitions, divorce, and new parental relationships, Pokemon Silver was a brilliant distraction from it all. I have distinct memories of going to bed, only to slide my Game Boy Color out from under the pillow, clipping on my book light just right to avoid the glare on the screen, turning on the in-game radio and truly immersing myself in another world for a short time. DJ Mary and her 8-bit music helped me escape a reality I was struggling to adapt to. In a time very shortly after 9-11, this may sound like an exaggeration, but in a time when everyone was scared and life was changing fast, as a child, being able to choose what 8-bit radio station I listened to was comforting. And there were many points that hit the nostalgia button in my brain while reading this manga, but I digress. The end of Pokemon Adventures left us on a cliffhanger. A very brief introduction to Silver and his communications with Green. There's a pattern emerging here. Introduce the protagonist, introduce the rival, leave it a couple of volumes, and then introduce the third to complete the trio. And so it's time to introduce our rival into the story. Another nostalgia hit. I was really excited the first time I saw Silver in game. Peering in through the window of Elm's lab after you receive your first Pokemon, his only response telling you to leave him be, he let me know bigger things were coming, to expect more from this game than the previous. Only it hits differently this time. He's still there to steal a starter Pokemon, but we've already seen this trope before, in green. And so it's not exciting or a shock anymore. And here is the first hit of disappointment. I realise the sequel is going to have to work even harder than it should to get my approval. Not only is it a sequel to a manga series I now love, but it is also the adaptation of my singular favourite childhood game. Every decision that is made, I judge 
twice. Did it ever really stand a chance? Gold has his first encounter with Silver once he and Joey reach Elm's lab. They're hurrying there because while they were on their way over, somebody stole Gold's bag of Pokemon. An unusual choice to bring all yours and your mum's house Pokemon with you on your journey. Somebody has mistaken Gold's house Pokemon for Joey's Professor Pokemon. Their guess at a certain someone's next destination when they realise they've stolen the wrong Pokemon? Elm's lab. When they arrive, Gold declares they should enter around the back to act like the thief in order to catch them. I was reluctant in my use of the word delinquent to describe goal previously, but the more I think about it, the more apt it is. And while we're judging him for being able to think like a thief, it works. He catches Silver right in the act. Only Silver didn't steal his Pokemon. And while Gold is busy throwing accusations at Silver for something he admittedly didn't do, despite having a stolen Pokemon in his pocket, he uses said stolen Totodile to defeat Gold who, despite having the best interests, uh, picks up a Cyndaquil that was angry his friend was stolen and, well, fighting water with fire was never going to end well. Team Rocket make a timely appearance to knock Gold out with a swift thunderbolt and Silver disappears, leaving just his glove and the burnt lawn of Professor Elm's lab after their battle in his wake. Pushing the delinquent description even more, Gold is woken by the police charging him with the destruction of property. He did burn the lawn after all. Luckily, Joey's got his back, and while Gold is still taken to the station for information, it's to draw up a picture of Silver for stealing Totodile rather than for Gold's arrest. But to leave everything to the police would be no fun, right? Um, besides, Gold's now holding a grudge and has a score to settle. So he gives a false description and charges out with Cyndaquil and Toe to help their little fire reptiles free his stolen friend and to find his own stolen Pokemon. Professor Oak very quickly tracks Gold down on a tip from the police. Turns out someone's stolen a Pokedex too, and Oak needs to confirm whether Silver had one when he was battling Gold. He also happens to have possession of Gold's bag with his house Pokemon in while he's there, which is convenient. Next on the list, we need to get Gold a Pokedex, but for the first time, Oak doesn't like what he sees in our protagonist off the bat. Turns out, having a reputation for being a delinquent isn't paying off. His reputation and soul hurt, Gold goes off to do some serious training. He wants to prove himself. He knows he can be better than the sum of his actions so far, but in true Gold style, he doesn't think, and he ends up endangering both his and his Pokemon's lives. Maybe there is something good about Gold's personality, an ability to grow on a personal level, to be able to reflect inwardly and go, I'm not happy with this, and change. If the first Pokemon Adventures is teaching us to respect our environment and the creatures of our planet more, maybe Gold and Silver is teaching us to reflect and improve. That nobody's perfect, and that's okay. Look inwards, improve to your own standards, and try again. Even though Oak ends up saving our protagonist from the results of his own actions, in the end, he put his Pokemon first. He saved them before he saved himself. In the manga, he calls them partners, and that's what persuades Oak to give Gold a Pokedex, but I feel there's more of an argument for him seeing them as more worthy than himself, for placing the importance of their lives before his own. Despite all of his pretty selfish behaviour so far, when it was important, he was selfless, and that has its own merit. And that is the basic setup to our story for the first two volumes. As Gold learns more about Silver, so do we. He encounters other trainers and gym leaders along the way, but every time we meet Silver, there's a pattern. They battle, something goes wrong, and when it matters, they both put themselves and their egos aside to work for other people and other Pokemon. And then, inevitably, Silver slips away. Selflessness. It's becoming a common theme. There's brief moments of nostalgia in these chapters through the Bellsprout Tower, Slowpoke Tales, Team Rocket, and Apricorn Balls but I'm starting to think maybe this delinquent isn't so bad after all. And then something unexpected happens. Gold is trusted with something precious, an egg. Despite all of his best efforts, Professor Elm can't hatch it because he's stuck in hospital after Silver's attack and an egg needs to be around active Pokemon to hatch. Maybe the attributes that make gold special are starting to shine through. I want to make a specific point of talking about an instance that happens at the beginning of chapter 99 though. We get our first look at the repercussions of the first series. Bill is trying to convince the board of directors for the Pokemon League that they need better qualifiers for gym leaders. I mean, who can blame him? Nearly half of the Kanto League was working for Team Rocket. And the response he gets truly resonates within me. The board claims that nothing should be done because nothing can be proved. That even though these people did notoriously horrible actions, no justice should be done because 
we weren't there. There's only witness statements. They left no proof and we're not willing to try and get proof. Why don't you go fix the Pokemon storage system? And this, this of all points really got to me. How many people had to speak up before anything was done about Jeffrey Epstein? And how many people have to die before something can be done about police brutality? Or how many lives is our society willing to ruin because of instances just like this that aren't happening in a book, but with real people sitting in boardrooms deciding what we want for us? Pokemon is again screaming at us about the faults in our lives. For a child series, it sure does make some good points. And as we close volume one, we enter Elix Forest and are faced with the true villain of our tale, the Masked Man. He overpowers gold so easily that it's scary. He is intimidating in his presence and design. I mean, look at him. This is not a normal Pokemon design. The thought of if he's even human crosses my mind for a moment. And I start to wonder what his story is. Like Lance before him, what's his backstory? One of my favourite aspects of the original Pokemon adventures is how relatable Lance and Lorelei were and their reasons for their actions. But here I am comparing again. Something catches our masked man's attention and he leaves Gold stranded in the forest, both him and his Pokemon feeling truly and utterly defeated for the first time. At least with Silver, he can hold his own and put up a fight. Here, he's left raw. He's shaken, but he moves forward. After more gym leader interactions, on a quick recap, Gold's egg hatches into a rather delinquent Togepi, which is pretty funny. He's told by Elm to reach out to the couple who discovered the egg, and at the daycare center, the old man calls up gym leader Jasmine because they're good friends and she's interested in the egg, and then while she's passing through Ecritique City to get there, disaster hits. An earthquake. Gold and Silver have another selfless moment in saving Jasmine, and for the first time, Silver opens up to Gold about ho -Oh. And that's it for Gold. At this point, he can't leave Silver to go through this on his own. And for the first time, instead of slipping out of sight, Silver lets him follow. And then finally, one book and about roughly 140 pages later, we get to see our old protagonists again. Red and Yellow are coming to Johto to chase down the huge Pokemon Lance released in the last series. And a moment of hope rises in me. Flashback to Gold and Silver, they're investigating Rampage and Gyarados at the Lake of Rage. Another moment of nostalgia hits, the Red Gyarados. For many, the first shiny Pokemon they ever came across. Once again, I'm 10 and hiding under my covers past bedtime. But this time, my peaceful and joyous nostalgia is interrupted. The Masked Man appears, and the ensuing fight is more bonding than fighting. Silver is an escapee of the Masked Man, another child taken from their home, just like Green. The fight is now personal, but the Masked Man is not to be taken lightly. Gold and Silver are defeated and left to drown in the centre of the Lake of Rage, and we don't see them again for another two volumes. We've just been left with a lot of information from the last quarter of our second volume in Gold and Silver. Similar to the original series, we're about to hit a divergence, but I can't be sure if this divergence is on purpose. This is a point to reflect. The first two volumes of Gold and Silver have a surrealness about them. They are so familiar, and yet something is missing. The art. The art is lacking in comparison to our first series, and in a manga, visuals are key. They're used to literally drag our brains into this world laid out before us, and so if the art is lacking, it's hard to get us involved. At this point in our story, I am in no way as attached to this world as I was within the red chapters of the first series. Marto retires. From recent interviews that I have found talking about Mato, Hidenori Kasaka says this is the singular most difficult part of working on this whole series. Mato has fallen ill and the work they are outputting is not at the same standard. Their body has failed them and so with a heavy heart, they retire. And the Pokemon company hires someone who casually admits they don't know anything about Pokemon. <laughs> there is an uproar in the community. Our new artist isn't accepted and they fall into depression. They keep working, but Marto's fans do not make this transition easy. And so our third volume is the start of a new era, a new artist. 
And I can't figure out if the choice to spend the next nearly two volumes focused on a new character was a choice that was always going to be made from the start, after all something similar did happen with Yellow, or if this choice is to get the readers adjusted to a new art style before reintroducing characters they already know and love, drawn in a different way. You'll have to let me know if my gender has dictated a bias in this, but from volume 3 and the introduction of Crystal onwards, my excitement is renewed. The series feels like it has energy again, new life has been brought into it, in the fictional and the real world, and despite my feeling of betrayal towards the Pokemon company for hiring a non-Pokemon fan, I feel refreshed. It's time to complete our trio. Crystal, or Chris, is introduced when Oak puts out an ad for a talented trainer to take his final Pokedex. He's told to meet said trainer at school, but he arrives to find a herd, is that even the right word, of Slugma attacking. Claiming to everyone that as soon as he's here, I'm sure he'll jump in to help, Chris promptly whips off her apron, presenting biker shorts underneath what was an assumed skirt, and continues to save the day. Oak promises to fix up the school in return for a completed Pokedex, and she's on her way. Although, in the rush, Oak accidentally forgets to introduce Elm and the Chikorita she's meant to be taking with her, and the Chikorita rushes on after her. From here, she accepts Chikorita into the team, and she goes off capturing every Pokemon she comes across and helping whoever she runs into along the way, including Bill and Lieutenant Surge, until she comes across Suicune, our first introduction to the legendary dogs. The rest of Volume 3 is more Suicune's story than it is anybody else's. Suicune's on the hunt to find a suitable partner, um, for what means we don't know yet, but we follow the majestic ice dog as he battles every gym leader to test them. Chris meets Eswine, a, I think I'm pronouncing that right, a Suicune tracker, and together they follow Suicune. Chris is enamoured by Suicune's grace and majesty, she's never met another Pokemon like it. And we finish volume 3 just outside the burnt tower where the legendary dogs were made. Nostalgia hits again. This time, an empathy for Crystal's and Eswine's frustrations at trying to track Suicune. In the games, once you meet a legendary dog, you can track its movements on your map, only it's not as easy as it sounds. If you have to fly to where Suicune is, he'll have moved by the time you get there, and if you're in the next town and need to walk to the route, he'll have moved when the page loads. Suicune, Entei and Raiko are quick and frustrating to catch. And seeing our heroine and her friend struggle to find Suicune using the same methods is frustrating to read, but also relieving. As a kid, I always wondered if I was doing something wrong. I blamed myself for not being able to catch Suicune, and finally, nearly 20 years later, I can be reassured that I was doing the right thing. It was always designed to feel like a wild goose chase. That is the second time I've thought about this phrase while writing this, and I start to realise that it sums up everything I disliked about the sequel. It was frustrating to read. Every plot point was a wild goose chase to get to, and the outcome wasn't satisfying enough to justify the means. I'm glad I can finally put into words what I've been feeling this whole time. Despite what I just said, Volume 4 has one of my favourite parts of the whole series in it. Halfway through the series, on a serious attempt, Chris fails to catch Suicune, and this is the first time after declaring herself the capturer that she's failed to fully capture a Pokemon. It breaks her. Full on shoujo anime Ghibli film tears breaks her. But it's not the actual breaking and the tears that are satisfying, it's knowing that this female, who has been looked down on for being the gender she was born, is about to test herself. We're about to see what Crystal is truly made of, and that's exciting. When I was a kid in the 90s, I wasn't allowed to play with boys' toys. I was actively made to feel bad for liking Bike Mice from Mars, X-Men and Power Rangers. I was encouraged to play with Barbie and to think I wouldn't ever be able to defend myself, and that while it was important to be intelligent, at the end of the day my role was to bring my mother a grandchild. I have an incredibly vivid memory of being at a friend's house after school one day. We were outside and she was trying to teach me how to skateboard. And while I was bad at it, it was fun. When my mother came to collect me though, she was horrified that we were being allowed to play outside, literally at the front of the house, without a parent watching. She screamed at my poor friend's mother in her own front yard before taking me home and saying I wasn't allowed to play there again. And the friend whose mother had been yelled at from that day on took the piss of the fact I was bubble wrapped. I didn't take offence at this, I fully knew it was true. I, I laughed at it, and I hated it. The boys clothes argument was a constant argument for a period of time in my house growing up. 
girls aren't supposed to wear surfing apparel hoodies and jeans and these are all the reasons I love Chris. Maybe it's because I wasn't allowed to consume the right type of media, I can't think of a better way to word that, but every time I see a female character get beaten down and then bring herself back up, I get a rush of dopamine, the reward hormone, as if I just tackled these tasks myself, because getting to vicariously experience what I wasn't allowed to as a child is rewarding. And maybe Crystal's character arc is so much more rewarding because it's initiated by her own mother, the motivating mother I never had. Crystal's mother sees her weeping and screams at her that she's a pro, she's better than this, and she can do it. To get up off her ass and get back to basics. To go train where and how the real trainer and Chris was born. I'm shocked, especially considering the very young Harajuku style that Chris's mum has. I haven't seen a parent act this encouragingly towards a child in a long while. It's refreshing. And with it, I feel refreshed as the reader. And then finally, series meet series. Protagonist meets protagonist. Yellow meets Crystal. Like, Chris is wary of Yellow, but ends up jumping on a boat with him anyway because they're heading in the same direction. But more important than that, Lieutenant Surge has finally found a hint as to where gold and silver are. And I feel like everything's coming together. Like, we're about to get this show on the road. And as Entei looms over our two male protagonists, I find myself wondering, when will we learn about the masked man? His life, his motivations, his grief. I love a good villain and I am so desperate for him to be one. Looking back, I think one of Gold and Silver's most unfortunate flaws is simply too many protagonists. We start volume 5 following DJ Mary and Whitney to see the ice type gym leader Price. And it feels disjointed. I am now away from every character I really know anything about. It's almost like there is too much character development spread too thinly. Spending so much time with all of these other gym leaders means I'm not spending any time with any of our main cast. I didn't like the discombobulating feeling of switching from red to yellow in the first series, but in the end this one character switch paid off. In gold and silver, I at most spend maybe a third of the volume with any one character, and this bobbing and diving leaves me feeling seasick. From what I've heard and personally read, in the early days of Pokemon, the Johto region has some of the most intense and diverse lore around. Even in the game, you complete your Johto journey and then you head back to Kanto to do it all over again. It was, at the time, the perfect sequel, expanding on what was great about the first. But it seems that if you try to fit all that knowledge into seven volumes, each with roughly 200 pages of manga, something gets lost. In all that flitting about, you lose the story. Embarking on a journey through the eyes of two regions worth of protagonists and gym leaders has left me feeling lost. The only important thing that comes out of our time with DJ Mary and Whitney is the last line Price says, that Suicune won't come to challenge him with good reason. And my brain goes, huh, why is that? What history does he have with Suicune? Kasaka has let me know that something's afoot, but was this one line worth being torn away from our main group for? We're plunged back into Gold and Silver's story, and that is honestly the best word I can think to describe it. Lieutenant Surge finds our boys, and then before you know it, we're faced with Lugia lifting up the whole SS Aqua and the boat that Crystal and Yellow are aboard. But something feels off. We've been building to this moment, facing Lugia again, but I don't feel invested. Maybe all this flitting from one character to another has had its toll, or maybe this feels like a plot device a reason for our trio of Pokedex holders to finally meet, and a reason for all their Pokemon to finally reach their final evolutions. It just doesn't feel as important as I thought it was going to feel. I feel let down by this series of events, and it's at this point that I first wondered whether I was going to find myself coming out of this series with that chemical high of hormones at the end. Our heroes try to catch Lugia, but when nothing returns in the Pokeball, they theorise they've been beaten to it. Gold lets Silver head out to deal with something personal, confident in their friendship and that he'll return in due course, and we're treated to a moment of relief, a moment of relaxed smiles before some dire disappointment. Silver goes to see Lance. And again, we flit to Misty, who Suicune accepts as its master, then another flit back in time to Yellow and how he released the legendary dogs from being trapped in a stone in the burning tower, then flit again to behind the scenes of a highly Nazi moment with the masked man, flit again to the beginning of the Pokemon League tournament, flit 
again back to the masked man confronting ho -Oh and flip one more time to gold and crystal going to view the pokemon league and an introduction to all the gym leaders as they stand ready for their exhibition matches end volume i'm dizzy I'm really trying to emotionally bond with any of these characters, but when you're not even sometimes spending more than four pages at a time with them, I just can't. It's exhausting trying to keep up. Volume 6 is made up of exhibition matches with moments of story in between, and I can't help but feel like this should be the other way around. We've only got one more volume after this, shouldn't the main focus be story over character development by now? Lance reveals that the masked man in fact wants to control time, that he's a gym leader, and Silver's final mission from him is to find out his identity. Yellow and Red's Pikachu have an egg together, and Green teleports Silver away to get stuck in on the action herself. These are the only important events to actually happen in the first two thirds of our second to last chapter. Isn't that rather odd? Even when it was just battling, I feel like everything that was happening in the original Pokemon adventures at this point was meaningful. I'm getting more disappointed. And finally, everything goes wrong. The masked man arrives with both Lugia and Ho-Oh under his control, takes the apricorn ball maker and announces he wants to capture time. But I just don't care. I'm not even aware of the consequences of capturing time. Does time end for everyone? Does the world end? like Lance was threatening? I just don't know. Every single chapter in the last volume is named The Last Battle, number one, number two, number three, etc. And just like its titles, it's, for the most part, a bit one note. There's a lot of screaming at each other, a lot of exclamation marks. Somehow, even at the climax of our series, despite the yelling and with so much happening, nothing feels important until we're 100 pages in, in Elex Forest, awakening Celebi. I'm not joking either, the amount of plot points that happen in this single volume is incredible, and they're all important. For all that I have to say about how this plot plays out, I cannot deny though that this last volume is exciting. It's action-packed, feel-good, and again references the original games for those nostalgia hits. There are many pros and many cons. And so the mindset in which we go into a sequel with might end up being more important than how good the sequel even is. Like I pondered at the beginning, maybe I've gone into this with the wrong mindset. There is no doubting that Pokemon Adventures Gold and Silver is fun, exciting, and action-packed. When you watch the John Wick movie series, you don't watch them for a thrilling storyline, although the setup of the story does hit hard. You watch it for the moments of awe in the fight, the no way did he just pull that off, the oofs, the woes, the holy shit, did he just do that moments? With Pokemon Adventures, I was so taken aback by how good the story was in the first series, I expected to keep going with that same momentum and possibly to get better from its starting point. And in my search for that same high, the high I got from a surprisingly good story, I missed out on what made Gold and Silver just so fun. Heads up, we've got some real spoilers for the story from here on, so if you want to skip to my final words about the series, head to this timestamp. But if you're along for the ride, for the last time, let's get stuck in. Okay, so the masked man has just revealed that his mission is to capture time in a Pokeball, and I'm still not sure of the consequences of this. He's kidnapping the apricorn ball maker because he knows he previously came up with a recipe for a Pokeball that can do just what he wants, which is convenient, and he knows he'll be safe to travel through time with Rainbow and Silverwing feathers from Ho-Oh and Lugia protecting him. Gold is frustrated, all this hurt and catastrophe versus something that seems like it could have been dealt with in a more quiet manner, he doesn't seem too sure of the consequences either. We check in on the gym leaders, who are stuck on a bullet train battling Team Rocket. It's revealed to us that Entei and Raiko chose partners in Blaine and Lieutenant Surge, which makes sense, both specialising in that specific type, and it's revealed that Team Rocket has been under some kind of evil spell this entire time. Fun fact, Rocket stands for Raid on the City Knockout Evil Tusks, an abbreviation of something motivational Giovanni used to say to them before they would go on a rampage. Lieutenant Surge detaches part of the bullet train with the three legendary dogs on it and half the gym leaders head back to the stadium to help out with the damage. Misty, Surge and Blaine get these cool, almost magical girl-like accessories designed to help them fight best with the legendary dogs and were treated to some good old legendary versus legendary action. It's revealed that this entire time the radio station at the stadium has still been broadcasting to the world, and this doesn't seem important at the time, but it is. And then as the masked man finds an opportunity to escape, he does so. 
and Whitney realizes who he is. Through all of this fighting, the masked man has had holes blown in him, he's been chopped in half, and I am still questioning if he's even human. But before she can say it, it cuts. And we hear the masked man talking to himself about what all of this is even about. La Prusse and La Prie. My head nearly says Lapras while reading these names, and I think, is this all about two Lapras? Upon catching up with the masked man, Gold is actually able to continuously do some serious damage, and finally the cape and mask are destroyed, leaving the person behind this laid bare, Price, the Mahogany Town gym leader. I am disappointed. He seemed like the obvious option, and so I had assumed that it probably wasn't him, because that wouldn't be good storytelling, surely. But it is. This little old man sitting in a chair with his pillar swine, using a body made of ice to become so threatening, only he doesn't feel so threatening anymore. We check in on Green, who's in Elex Forest, and despite the disappointment from Price, I'm treated to another wave of nostalgia. In the video game, Karen and Will are in the Elite Four, but in this retelling, they've been working for Price since they were children. I make the assumption that they were taken from their homes too. That after the other silver and rainbow wings, they know Green has in her possession, but they're wrong, and they've actually been under our noses this entire time. An even quicker check-in on Yellow, who's being ambushed by Team Rocket members, still under the spell in hopes of acquiring the feathers on his hat. Our Pikachu parents and Egg tie balloons to themselves and float away to save their family, and more nostalgia hits. And then Green is faced with her worst fear, ho -Oh. And all of the memories of being taken and surviving through everything with Silver by her side are there in her mind, as if they're happening right at this very moment. When she snaps out of it, Silver is hanging from a tree, and more memories come flooding back. She snaps. And as ho -Oh flies straight over her, the fear is drowned out by anger and rage. Empowered, she gets to reveal what she's been doing this whole time. Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres are released from their Pokeballs, and again it's time for some intense Legendary versus Legendary battles. Red stops by just in time to save the rest of the bullet train from certain death before heading off with Blue to the fight at Elex Forest, briefly bumping into Koga and Bruno, who explain that anyone who captures Celebi can time travel while they're on their way. And then they're there, dumbstruck and in awe of the fight between all of these flying legendaries going on above their heads. In true protagonist style, they jump on the two unpiloted birds and the fight is on once again. And all of this before Price even gets there. Still with Price, Gold saves the Pikachu family from his grasp and then is delivered a letter from Oak. As Price disappears, with just over a third of our final volume left, it's time to build some hype. Oak reveals that every person who he's entrusted with a Pokedex so far has something that makes them special. The fighter, the trainer, the healer, the catcher, the evolver, the exchanger. But he leaves Gold out. And in the presence of this rush of extreme emotion, the Pikachu egg hatches. Gold isn't talentless at all. He is the hatcher. Just through the energy he emits, he gives them the energy of life. Powered by Gold's energy and the electrical power of all the legendary Pokemon around the area, the freshly hatched Pichu is able to open up a vortex in the sky and take Gold through it on their mission to find Price. Back at the stadium, Misty is too injured to continue to be Suicune's trainer, and the legendary dog accepts Chris as its new partner before charging out to Elex Forest. And while we're here, faxes have been coming through to the radio station. Messages of support from people around the Pokemon world, wishing they could send their Pokemon to help. And with that, Bill realises what's been wrong with the storage system all along. He's able to fix the system and send out a message to trainers around the world asking for their Pokemon in a time of need. Pokemon from all over burst from the Pokemon Center in Azalea Town, bringing their passion and the love from their trainers with them, and they literally melt the evil from Lugia and Ho-Oh's hearts. Another nostalgia hit although this time from a different monster show. I've always loved the first Digimon movie. I can't count how many times I've watched it, but at that moment, at the end of the second part, when Izzy sends all the love, support, and power through email into the digital world and it saves our heroes, every damn time while watching, I have a realization. I'm not breathing. 
And with the first breath, my heart relaxes and I get that rush of endorphins halfway through the film. When I realize what's happening in Pokemon Adventures, my heart soars. This individual moment brings me so much joy and warmth. I smile. With the legendary duo back in the world, our team can focus on finding Price. And as all our Pokedex holders corner him for one final fight, Crystal realizes something's missing. Gold. Celebi appears and Price creeps into what can only be described as a time portal and then Silver spots him. Gold is trapped in the same way the legendary dogs were. Yellow is forced to remove her hat in front of Red for the first time and reveal her gender. It's a sweet moment but there are more important things afoot. They use the feathers to free gold before Silver and Crystal join him on the back of the legendary dogs on a literal journey through time all of the events that have happened before passing before them and then finally we catch up to Price in the past as he witnesses the death of his two Lapras. He's left heartbroken while holding their freshly hatched baby in his arms. All this because after all these years he couldn't move on from the grief of losing two friends he loved. Grief will do funny things to you. A final moment of selflessness. Gold shoves Silver and Crystal out of the void so him and Price can go down together. A final Raikou charged Pichu attack and our hero and villain fall into the void of time, listening to a song Price's friends wrote for him to cheer him up after the death of his Lapras. Our cast fear they have lost Gold, but a Pokemon protagonist can't die and he's on top of Celebi's trying, being a cocky little get once more. We sum up our stories in the same way we did in the original Pokemon Adventures. Little snippets telling us what's to become of everyone and where they're going now. It ends, or at least I thought it was. Oak asks what time it is, declares he's running late, welcomes us to the wonderful world of Pokemon and then asks for our name. And in a moment of brilliance we come full circle. Oak hands us a Pokedex and all of a sudden we're ten again, hiding under our covers with a book light, being comforted by the idea that we get to choose what 8-bit radio station we listen to. According to Writer's Digest, there are seven rules for writing a strong sequel. Don't just pick up where the last story left off. Give the reader something new. Make the stakes different. Play with expectation. Include at least one new great character. Don't be afraid to let beloved characters go. And identify what made the first special, then offer more. Kind of. And honestly, and unfortunately, that pretty perfectly sums up how I feel about reading the first sequel to Pokemon Adventures. Did I enjoy it? Kind of. It was fun, action-packed, fast-paced, had exciting characters, fun plot points, and many nostalgia hits. But the villain didn't feel as important as Lance or Giovanni. What he was trying to accomplish didn't feel very end of the world. In fact, if you check the Bulbapedia page, it claims he was never trying to capture time, just a Pokemon that would enable him to travel through it. And I just can't help but feel that if his only intentions were to save these two Lapras and reunite them with their child, then all of this was avoidable. I don't understand why Price had to get Team Rocket involved in the first place. It appears their only real use was to distract our gym leaders on a train and to create an earthquake to summon Ho-Oh. They weren't really needed. As a character that has proved he is more than competent, couldn't he have just done all of this himself under his disguise? He just doesn't make sense. And there was so much story to cram into what is in reality such a short space of time that it felt cramped. There's even a love triangle between Misty, Yellow and Red brought up towards the end and my only reaction is, wait, this is unnecessary. In trying to achieve so much, we spend too much time away from our main cast. There's also too many times for my own personal comfort that something so conveniently happens that it just doesn't feel real. It's not as grounded as the original. None of this is to say that if you're after a fun read, something easy to wake up to on a weekend or to fall asleep to, that you won't enjoy this manga. In my enthusiasm for the original, I've forgotten. Pokemon is a kids series. I was about 10 or 11 when this manga came out and I'm reminded of that in the casual sexism and the existence of faxes. But some of you don't even know what a fax is. <laughs> this is fantastic children's writing. 
I just felt misled by the gravitas of the first series and my love of the video game's first sequel. Hey guys, Tofu here. I just wanted to say that if you made it to the end of this video, then thank you so much for watching. Pokemon Silver holds a really dear place in my heart, so I couldn't really give an honest review or retrospective of its it in manga form without getting really personal. And I'm really aware of how long this video is probably going to be, but don't worry, I'm sure since the retrospective for Ruby and Sapphire will be much shorter. <laughs> Sound off in the comments with your own personal Pokemon memory, I'd really love to hear them. And obviously, again, this is a new series, so if you've got any feedback, I'd also love to hear that. But in the meantime, I hope that everybody's staying happy and healthy. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everyone! As per usual, I just want to give a really big shout out to my patrons. Your guys' support means the world to me and I really, really appreciate you being there and deciding to support me in the future. If anybody's interested in becoming a patron, link will be in the description down below. You get early access to videos. But yeah, thank you so much, guys. Again, I really, really appreciate it.